Well, and a fine good morning to you subscribers. It's Russ Barkley. Who else? I know you were looking for Saturday morning cartoons, but this is not it. Or maybe it is. I'm kind of dressed like Outlander, hoping some hot woman from 100 years from now might just show up and time travel through some wormhole into my life. Or maybe not. So, well, let's start with some dad jokes, and then we've got four articles to talk about. The first dad joke comes to us from community.spiceworks.com. And this is, I bought some shoes from a drug dealer. Not sure what they were laced with, but I've been tripping all day. <laughs> you know, that's kind of a double dad joke if you think about it. Well, here's another one. I lost my job at Pepsi last week after working there for many years. I tested positive for Coke. <laughs> All right, last one. Why can't dinosaurs clap their hands? Because they're extinct. Did you know that dogs can't operate an MRI? But cats can. Get it? Cats can? Ha ha ha. Okay, well, I've ruined your Saturday already, so let's get on with this week's research reviews. First up is an interesting paper that was published a few months ago over in Psychiatry Research. This one comes to us out of China, and it's a study of small samples of adults with ADHD and healthy control adults looking at the effects of acute single episode aerobic exercise. <clears throat> Excuse me. Got a frog down there today. And they were looking at brain activity cortical excitability and inhibition in these adults with ADHD. So keep in mind, this is just one session of aerobic exercise, and then they go on and measure the brain activity in these adults. There were 26 adults with ADHD, 26 healthy matched control adults. Okay, so what did they find? Actually, surprisingly, they found the opposite result for the ADHD adults versus the healthy control adults. They found that in the healthy adults, there was enhanced cortical facilitation and decreased cortical inhibition after exercise. But in contrast to that, in the ADHD adults, they found the opposite. There was a reduction in the cortical facilitation and enhanced inhibition. It's kind of what we talked about before, where exercise, even only brief exercise, does help to some extent with inhibitory ability or self-regulation. And this study seems to suggest that that is happening because of these differences in brain mechanisms. So uh, interesting paper over there. Uh, and let's move on to our next one, which is another study of brain activity. This one looking at functional connectivity, especially in the brain's default mode network in patients with and without schizophrenia. Now, I'm going to just briefly show you what that default mode network looks like right here. And this is a part of the brain that is primarily in the posterior or back part of the brain with interconnections functional connectivity up to the frontal lobes. You can kind of see it in the lower graph of the brain here, where we see the highlighted regions in the posterior part of the brain, but also some regions up here in the frontal lobe. Why is that? Because when we are just doing nothing, like sitting in a doctor's office, we start to mind wander and the default mode network is responsible for that. We have no goals, no intentions, so the frontal lobe decreases its activity. That's the goal-directed part of the brain, and it lets the rest of the brain go rogue. And that's the default mode network just kind of skipping around to various ideas. And on the other hand, if there is a goal to be done, <clears throat> excuse me, then what we find is that frontal pole up there at the front part of the brain, that's inhibitory, and that's going to reach back and dampen down that rogue or renegade default mode network in order for us to enhance our concentration to a goal that we are trying to accomplish. Pretty cool, huh? Okay, well, that's what this article is about, and they're comparing 
adults with ADHD to adults with schizophrenia. Now, again, we're talking about very small samples here, so we've got to be careful about these results and not trying to overinterpret them. There were 20 patients in the schizophrenia group, 20 in the adult ADHD group, and they had 20 healthy controls. And what did they find? Well, let's read it here. The schizophrenia and ADHD groups showed low and high levels of functional connectivity in the default mode network, meaning the schizophrenia group had low activity, whereas the ADHD group had high connectivity and activity in that default mode network, perhaps explaining why adults with ADHD often complain about intrusive, irrelevant thoughts and an increase in mind wandering relative to other adults. And as you know from my earlier videos, this kind of mind wandering is especially common in people with the other attention disorder we call cognitive disengagement syndrome. So differences in the connectivity and functioning of the brain's default mode network between schizophrenia and ADHD, showing that they're quite distinct disorders, even at the level of functional connectivity. By the way, the functional connectivity in this region was related to inattention, but to different kinds of inattention between the two clinical groups. So kind of an interesting study there that once again shows that the DMN or default mode network is implicated in ADHD besides the massive amount of evidence for the involvement of the frontal lobe executive circuits and their connections back into the brain. Okay, enough about that study. That was also published over in Psychiatry Research. Here's one that was published over in Evidence-Based Practices in Child and Adolescent Mental Health. This is done by Sheila Eiberg and colleagues. She, Sheila is a longtime friend of mine who actually was on the faculty at the Oregon Health Sciences University when I trained there in 1976. Ouch, man, that hurts. But uh, Sheila was just on the faculty there, and both of us had learned a approach to behavioral parent training from a senior faculty woman there in psychology called Connie Hanf, H-A-N-F. Although Connie didn't publish much in her career, she was one of the first to develop behavioral parent training models. And her program inspired many others, including my program, Defiant Children, Sheila's program, Parent-Child Interaction Therapy. They're both very similar, of course, uh, because we both learned at the, uh, at the same institute. And it also goes on to uh, inspire Rex Forehand's program for non-compliant children, Charles Cunningham's program in Canada called COPE, Community Opportunities for Parent Education, and so on. So Connie had a profound effect on the field of behavioral parent training even though she didn't publish much. It was primarily through students and faculty who had trained at Oregon while Connie was there. Okay, well, this is a study by Sheila, who is now, by the way, at the University of Florida. And Sheila is going to compare group parent-child interaction training with individual therapy, which is how it's often delivered. But you can do both, just as you can with my program, you can run groups or you can train parents individually. Well, she's comparing the effectiveness of both of them. Now, why isn't there a control group in this study? Because there is substantial evidence already in the literature relative to various control conditions that Sheila's parent-child interaction therapy does help families to cope better with children with ADHD and disruptive behavior. Now, in this study, Sheila is going to look at the effects on preschool children with ADHD alone and those who had ADHD with behavioral problems. She goes on to report that both intervention groups did well. Well, we would expect that, uh, given the evidence already available. But she did find that only children who had ADHD alone and who received the parent-child interaction therapy on an individual basis for their families showed the highest rates of change across time. 
whereas the group that also had disruptive behavior disorders changed, but not quite as much. Why would that be the case? Because ADHD kids who also have oppositional disorder, conduct disorder, they're more severe, number one. Two, they often have more problems within their families and their family dynamics, if you want to call it that. Three, their parents have a higher rate of psychological problems, including adult ADHD, compared to the group without these disruptive behavior problems. So there's lots of good reasons why that group might be a little less likely to improve, though they did improve, compared to families with ADHD children alone. So a nice paper there by my friend Sheila and her colleagues showing yet more evidence for the effectiveness of her program. So if you're interested, you can just Google parent-child interaction therapy. You'll see lots of evidence for it. Use Google Scholar. You'll see a lot of journal articles about it. It's very similar, as I said, to my program, Defiant Children. All right, our last paper up is going to come to us from the journal Appetite. And no surprise, it's about the association of executive functioning with food addiction among children with various levels of ADHD symptoms. This is also a study out of China. Now, this is using a large sample, a cross-section of Chinese children involving over 1,000 children between 6 and 18 years of age, and their parents completed not only rating scales of ADHD, but also rating scales of executive functioning, um, such as my own rating scales, although they didn't use mine in this particular study. Shame on them. Okay, what did they find? They found that as the level of ADHD symptoms went up, the risk for food addiction went up by about 60%. They also found that if you split this big population of children into those in the lowest, medium, and highest quartiles, that the risk for food addiction got greater and greater and greater the more you moved up in these quartiles of executive function ratings. What's a quartile? It's 25 percentiles in the group. So you go from 25 percent, 50 percent, then you have the 75th percentile, which is high, and the 75th to 100th percentile, the upper quartile, which is the highest level of ADHD. And by the way, here's what they found very interesting. So if you look at the uh, risk, those who were average in executive functioning did not have any increase in food addiction. But those who were in the second quartile, that is the next highest, went up 3.7 times higher risk. And those in the next upper quartile, that means even more ADHD and executive functioning deficits, they found that it was seven times greater. So it's not just a linear increase, it's a marked increase in risk for food addiction as level of ADHD symptoms and degree of executive functioning increases. So no surprise that children who have difficulties with self-regulation, which is what executive functioning is all about, are going to have the greatest problems with food addiction. Okay, well, that's our review for this week. Hope you enjoyed it. Look forward to seeing you next week on the channel for another research review. And check me out during the week for other commentaries. As always, if you're not a subscriber, think about it. Just hit that subscribe button. And if you are and you know people that might benefit from the content of my channel, please recommend us to them. I really appreciate that. Okay, everybody, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week. Take care, be well, and bye for now.